Hello and welcome to the week 4 supplemental lecture on Michael Polanyi's The Republic of Science. This piece is going to unpack what Polanyi believes the sort of core values and institutional structures of science are. He'll focus a great deal on institutional structures, and the punchline by the end of this piece is actually to draw some implications for social structures in general, for political institutions and other kinds of institutions, based on what he thinks is the successful institutional structure of science. So Polanyi starts with the claim that science operates as a community and that we can draw useful analogies to a body politic or to an economy. He says the distinguishing characteristic of science is the way that its members cooperate in a coordinated way. There's constant interaction with others required for sustained progress in the field. If people were isolated and separated from each other, they'd quite quickly draw to a halt. They'd exhaust existing problems and not have enough new impetus to go forward. And he talks about it as a process of coordination by mutual adjustment of independent initiatives, of initiatives which are coordinated because each takes into account all other initiatives operating within the same system. So it's decentralized, it is individual, but these individuals are through various institutional processes, aware of what the other individuals are doing, and they're constantly adapting their own activities to those other individuals. And he has this analogy that he draws to a jigsaw puzzle and different ways that you might try to sort of crowdsource the solution to a jigsaw puzzle. And he says that science operates as though everyone has access to all the same pieces and we can watch people solve particular pieces of the puzzle and then move on ourselves to the next bit that needs to be solved, constantly aware of where the latest solutions can be found in the puzzle. Okay, so he says the fact that everyone works independently, but they can see the results of the work done by everyone else is essential to how science operates as a decentralized decision-making body. So there's an analogy here to how the market operates, and he explicitly refers to Adam Smith's concept of the invisible hand. But we're going to find as we go through this that he actually thinks that both science and the market are themselves examples of a higher order process that is the one that he thinks we actually ought to be emulating. So he's not trying to say run science like a market or science is a kind of market. He's trying to say that both the market, the capitalist market, and scientific enterprises have something in common that lets them achieve interesting things, successful things, through decentralized coordination of individual activities. So he says you can get a better aggregate result than you could plan out in advance or than you could dictate the process for achieving. He says such self-coordination of independent initiatives leads to a joint result which is unpremeditated by any of those who bring it about. Their coordination is guided by an invisible hand toward the joint discovery of a hidden system of things. So no one has a blueprint in advance. We don't, in fact, know where science is going. If we did, we wouldn't need science to get us there. So he says the end result is unknown, but this kind of cooperation needs to advance stepwise. Okay, we need to just see what we've done, and then we need to move a little bit beyond that and a little bit beyond that step by step by step and we'll inch our way toward the next step in the process. The total performance, he says, will be the best possible if each consecutive step is decided upon by the person most competent to do so. The effectiveness of a group of helpers will then exceed that of any isolated member to the extent to which some member of the group will always discover a new chance for adding a bit of the puzzle more quickly than any isolated member could have done for him by himself. Okay, so they can all sort of spy on each other's pro progress because there's a principle of publishing your results and those results only counting if they're part of the public discussion. Uh, and then the people who are best primed to take advantage and to make a new contribution can do that because of this general publicity. Polanyi says coordination under a single authority would reduce effectiveness and efficiency. It would bring the progress of science virtually to a standstill. And he has historical examples. He's thinking particularly of the way in which the Soviet Union intervened in the process of science. But he also has some examples from the UK that he'll get into. 
So what's the relationship between the free market and science? He's used this invisible hand analogy. It sounds like he's saying that science sort of operates as a market, but he clarifies that he regards the market as a special case of coordination by mutual adjustment. So what he's after is looking at institutions, and the market and science he thinks are two of the successful ones. We'll find out later that he thinks that maybe you can model other social institutions on this same principle. The idea is that you have some institutional structure in place that allows individuals to see what other individuals are doing, to feel the result of that, and to have some incentive to make a contribution where they best can in that decentralized decision-making system we'll see more theories about capitalism and the capitalist market as a decentralized decision-making system when we get into our theme on economics a bit later in the course. So in science, the ability to do the mutual adjustment relies on individual scientists noticing results published by others. In market, it's the price signal that does this same thing. The market price signal serves a dual function. It lets people see what other people are doing and mutually adjust, and it also provides an incentive to contribute something useful to the process. Professional standards and the publication system are what serve these functions for science. So he's not suggesting privatize scientific uh, analysis or discovery or work. He's saying that there is already a decentralized system at work in science, and it already has a structure of incentives built in that enable it to operate and achieve good results through decentralized self-management. And he says that it provides built-in incentives that are different from the price signal that allow a scientist to allocate scarce resources. And those scarce resources are the scientist's own intellect. Okay, We've got limited attention to spare. We've got limited talents. And the system of publications, by revealing what we currently know and what the current problems are, allows scientists to allocate their own efforts to problems that are not too difficult for them to solve, not too easy for them to solve, that provide what Polanyi calls the line of greatest excitement, sustaining the most intense attention and effort of thought. So each individual scientist will allocate themselves somewhere in this, like people allocate themselves in the market, and they'll contribute what they can best contribute to the whole by seeking that sort of individually optimal point where they can make a contribution. So how do we assess scientific merit? And Polanyi, like a lot of our authors in this topic this week, is concerned with how we distinguish science from pseudoscience or from anti-science or non-science. And he comes up with a few categories that sit in interesting tension with each other. So the first he talks about is plausibility. He says, scientific publications are continuously beset by cranks, frauds, and bunglers whose contributions must be rejected if journals are not to be swamped by them. This censorship, and he calls it censorship, he's not troubled by the idea that you're censoring cranks, frauds, and bunglers, will not only eliminate obvious absurdities, but must often refuse publication merely because the conclusions of a paper appear to be unsound in light of current scientific knowledge. There are a lot of debates over the way scientific publication functions at present. The fact that it has a censoring quality. Uh, people can, of course, take their papers and they can go straight to the internet and get them out and get them into the public, but they've not been vetted by scientific peers, and so they're regarded as a sort of a substandard uh, form of publication. And yet there are flashpoints around science change, science change in particular, around uh, medical issues as well, where you have people who contest the way in which there's sort of a stranglehold on access to the mainstream academic journals, something that someone can write a paper on if they're interested. So we have plausibility. We've got scientific value. And he says scientific value is defined by three different things. Not every paper is going to possess each one to an equal degree. They can partially offset each other. But it's comprised of a combination of accuracy, systematic importance, and intrinsic interest. And he makes funny comments here. He says that the stuff that goes on in physics is not very interesting intrinsically. But it makes up for that by a high degree of accuracy and a high degree of systemic importance. The stuff that goes on in biology is fuzzier. It's a little harder to pin down, but it's more interesting, he says. Uh, and so you get a balance of these across disciplines. This is probably a um, personal opinion of Polanyi's. I suspect that some physicists and biologists and other disciplines might disagree with his evaluation. 
And then he talks about originality. He says originality reflects the degree of surprise which its communication should arouse amongst scientists. Okay, so on the one hand, we're looking at how good something is based on the standards of the science that exists. On the other hand, we're looking at something that goes sufficiently beyond the science that exists that it's a little bit shocking. And he says these criteria balance out. So the first two criteria of plausibility and scientific value are essentially conservative in character. They try to keep people from doing crankish, bizarre things that are implausible in light of what we know. But the third category is innovative and creative and encourages people to disagree with the received tradition. And he thinks that this is an interesting and we'll see quite important tension built into scientific institutions. He says the authority of scientific standards is thus exercised for the very purpose of providing those guided by it with independent grounds for opposing it. The capacity to renew itself by evoking and assimilating opposition to itself appears to be logically inherent in the sources of authority wielded by scientific orthodoxy. This is a point that's also sometimes made about political liberalism that on the one hand it starts as something that's fairly exclusionary, that can be regarded as conservative in certain ways, but it seems to be amenable, with some resistance, to repeated challenges from the outside. He's making a similar claim about science here, that there is an established, recognized value in these challenges from outside current beliefs that keeps the whole process expanding and gives it a progressive character. And then he has a very interesting set of reflections on where does the authority reside. We're used to thinking of authority residing in a particular bounded institution like a government or government department or in a person, a particular individual or collection of individuals. Scientific authority is more diffuse than this and thinking through it is a challenge. He says, no single scientist has a sound understanding of more than a tiny fraction of the total domain of science. This is a point that Weber will also make, that things have gotten so specialized that in fact what you know really, really, really well, enough to assess new work in the field, is actually pretty small. So how can an aggregate of such specialists possibly form a joint opinion? And he says, well, the way that this operates is that your little bitty specialization substantially overlaps the specializations that are closest to yours. And this is true all the way across the field of scientific analysis. He says, so the whole of science will be covered by chains and networks of overlapping neighborhoods. So from one overlapping neighborhood to the other, agreement will be established on the valuation of scientific merit throughout all the domain of science. So one's own personal expertise gets more and more attenuated the further away from your specialization a claim becomes. But by knowing how things operate locally, by knowing that you and other specialists sort of help to monitor neighboring specializations and they help to monitor you, and by understanding that this is a system of institutions that extends all the way around, you get to the point that you can feel confident as an individual scientist having reasonable trust that claims that are made outside your area of expertise are vetted as well as the claims that are made inside your level of expertise. And so you can trust other parts of the institution because they're subject to the same kinds of checks and balances that your own part is. And Polanyi says this network is the seat of scientific opinion. So scientific opinion is a decentralized thing. It does not reside in any particular one institutional body or any particular small group of people. It is all through the network of scientific authority. Scientific opinion, he says, is an opinion not held by any single human mind, but one which, split into thousands of fragments, is held by a multitude of individuals, each of whom endorses the other's opinion at second hand, by relying on the consensual chains which link him to all the others through a sequence of overlapping neighborhoods. That said, there's an unequal distribution of scientific authority. And again, this is on analogy to the market as well. The market is a decentralized thing, but some things have more power than other things within that decentralized framework. In science, however, the unequal distribution tends to concentrate around things like seniority and the distinction that someone has gained through their own work. It is real power. 
It governs a variety of different things about how scientific positions are established and likely to be given credibility, but it is checked and balanced internally by the structure of scientific institutions. And so the consequence is that the distribution of scientific authority is established among the group of scientists. It's not opposed from above or from the outside. The body of scientists as a whole asserts the authority of science against lay opinion. But once any individual goes through the process of qualifying as a scientist, Polanyi says his submission to scientific opinion is entailed now in his joining a chain of mutual appreciations within which he is called upon to bear his equal share of responsibility for the authority to which he submits. Okay, so the scientists comprise the authority, submit to the authority, contest that authority in various ways, but submit to the judgment of their peers as to whether their contestations have been effective or not, and to the degree that there are particular scientists who have unusual influence over this process, the standards for making those scientists particularly important are themselves established by the network of scientists. So there's no outside body involved here, and the process is decentralized. Now, you could argue that this is a slightly utopian representation because in the actual institutional practice of science it may not always quite correspond to this ideal, but he's after the ideal here. And scientific authority has teeth. So it's exercised through how training is provided to new people who want to come in and become scientists. It's exercised through the refereeing system that gets journals uh, operating and gets works published. It's exercised through appointments at universities and to important bodies within the discipline, through interventions in the public sphere, and through grants and funding allocations. Okay, so there's teeth to the authority. And then he says there are incentive structures within science to maintain comparable scientific standards across diverse disciplines, regardless of how the research is funded, whether the funding is private or public. There are ways to make sure, he believes, that you have comparable standards of scientific validity, whether you're talking about biology or chemistry or physics or whatever. Okay, so that someone working within their own specialization has grounds to be reasonably confident that the other specializations are monitored at least as well. And again, there are people who would criticize this on the basis that there are more substantial funding distortions than this model is admitting. There are risks of organizing things this way, and one of the risks is too great a conservatism. And he points to examples of things that are, quite, that are now regarded as quite influential, quite important discoveries that were resisted for some period of time before they were allowed in, before they were regarded as sufficiently vetted. Now, the periods of time he's talking about are not incredibly long. A lot of them are on the order of a decade or so. But he says, scientific opinion may be mistaken and correct but unusual positions can be discouraged for a period of time. He thinks this is a risk worth taking. It's worth the delay in having the, the important insights sort of have to fight their way into the canon of accepted scientific thought. He says these risks have to be taken. Only the discipline imposed by an effective scientific opinion can prevent the adulteration of science by cranks and dabblers. He's worried about the cranks and dabblers. And this is a hot-button debate, okay, because there are a lot of people, again, taking advantage of resources like the Internet today or like open publication initiatives that are saying, look, all the ideas should be in the fray. Let them all be in. Don't use various institutional processes like your training systems, your academic appointment systems, your peer reviewing systems to shut views out. Let it all you know, sort of fight its way out as it in fact does fight its way out in the internet and to some degree in policy circles. But Palanya is saying there's a value in having these more conservative structures that everyone is expected to interact with and convince because it screens out a lot of noise and it screens out a lot of potentially damaging views uh, at the beginning of the process. He says, in parts of the world where no sound and authoritative scientific opinion is established, research stagnates for lack of stimulus, while unsound reputations grow up based on commonplace achievements or mere empty boasts. Politics and business play havoc with appointments and the granting of subsidies for research. Journals are made unreadable by including much trash. 
Okay? This is also a debate that is going on in a contemporary fashion. What happens when you get major cases of fraud that are overturned, or journals that are effectively fictitious journals that will publish anything that they get. There's a scandal going on right now in computer science uh, where people have generated deliberately nonsense papers and fired them off at a bunch of journals to prove that the journals basically don't have a peer review process because in fact they've published the nonsense. And things like this happen periodically. Um, major and important cases of fraud get detected where reviewing mechanisms within science institu scientific institutions are not adequate. So these are flashpoint debates now. He says it's also important to cultivate popular respect for scientific opinion, that if you've not managed to do this successfully, it ends up eroding the independence of scientists and the willingness of scientists to make what they're talking about and thinking about and discovering freely publicly available. Okay, so if they feel like something terrible is going to happen to them, if they publish a controversial result on a public level, uh, that result will stay concealed and this will impede scientific progress. Palani says, these are the principles of organization under which the unprecedented advancement of science has been achieved in the 20th century. Though it is easy to find flaws in their operation, they yet remain the principles by which the vast domain of collective creativity can be effectively promoted and coordinated. And again, when we get to our political topic, we'll see quite similar arguments made for various governmental structures, for democratic and liberal structures in particular, that there are flaws, uh, there are problems, but the argument's going to be made. We think it's the best we can do. What about the pressure for science to have a practical benefit? He's very conscious of this being an issue with increasing governmental funding. You're receiving public funds. It sounds sort of reasonable that you should be expected to demonstrate an immediate benefit to society, and indeed that society may be able to have a right to dictate what you're researching and how and what kind of resources that are spent on it. He talks about the opposition to research for its own sake. And again, a number of our readings this week will emphasize science as an activity that pursues truth for its own sake, sort of, you know, uh, monomaniacally. But he says trying to limit science by dictating what its immediate practical ends should be is impossible and nonsensical. He says the practical applications are often unknowable for some time after discoveries are made, and he talks about a sort of a funny little process where he and a colleague are pushed to indicate what the practical implications are of Einstein's theory of relativity in the mid-40s, and they can't think of any. Um, and then, of course, the practical possibilities explode in a literal sense, uh, in that they inform the development of atomic and nuclear weaponry, but also explode in a number of practical applications. But even that late, he wasn't able to specify what they would be, and certainly at the time these theories are being developed, there would have been no way to predict the applications that would arise from them. Often practical applications, he says, rely on combining your research with other kinds of research that may not even have taken place yet uh, that will generate these unforeseeable practical benefits. He says, any attempt at guiding scientific research towards a purpose other than its own is an attempt to deflect it from the advancement of science. You can kill or mutilate the advancement of science. You cannot shape it, for it can advance only by essentially unpredictable steps, pursuing problems of its own, and the practical benefits of these advances will be incidental and hence doubly unpredictable. Now this is something, again, that is debated over the newspapers right now. So the government is trying to decide what are the conditions of grants on research? And practical benefit is a thing that often needs to be demonstrated in order to get funding for research. Uh, funding for pure research, for pure science, is quite hard to come by. Okay, so Polanyi is taking a position in an argument, and it's a position arguably that at the moment is sort of on the losing side. This goes back and forth in different historical periods. There are times when states are much more supportive of pure science, of investigating things for their own sake. Uh, we're not quite in one of those periods right now. And then he goes through examples of failed attempts at central coordination. Now, looming in the background here is the Soviet Union as the big example. But he also talks about some examples in the West. And he says, I've not recorded this incident in order to expose its error. Okay, so the actual cases are not important. They're known in other forms. This is not an original contribution. He says, it's an important historical event. 
most major principles of physics are founded on the recognition of an impossibility, and no body of scientists was better qualified than the Royal Society to demonstrate that a central authority cannot effectively improve on the spontaneous emergence of growing points in science. It has proved that little more can or need be done toward the advancement of science than to assist spontaneous movements toward new fields of distinguished discovery at the expense of fields that have become exhausted. Okay, so this is a very similar argument to that made about the market. Okay, you need to get out of its way. This is an institution that regulates itself if it's left alone, and you need to step aside and let it self-regulate in its decentralized fashion. Okay? But interestingly, he doesn't say, I'm making an argument here with analogy to the market. I'm going to take insights from the market and suggest we apply them to science. He actually reverses the argument. He suggests that science offers a possible model for economics here. And what interests him is the fact that science involves decisions about how public funds should be dispensed. And he's essentially saying, look, they should be dispensed according to the priorities that the scientists collectively set themselves. And he suggests that this can be thought of as a possible solution to how we use our public funds in economics as well. That you can think about how to rationally distribute them by coming up with some mechanism that's similar to the overlapping neighborhoods mechanism that science uses. And so maybe science has something to give economics in this regard. So again, he's worrying about the issue of the receipt of public funds sparking demands for public accountability. And this is a very persuasive discourse. It is a very common uh, discourse at the moment. It's probably in the ascendant politically. He says that it's also based on a mistaken notion of what the public itself wants, as in what it means to be accountable to the public for receiving public funds. It assumes that what the public wants is directly, immediately applicable results from scientific investigation. And he thinks that that's sort of underselling or underestimating the public. Those who think the public is interested in science only as a source of wealth and power are gravely misjudging the situation. And then he says, the universities need to do a better job here. They need to stop trying to sell science just on the basis of what it can do for people, how it can increase money or power. And they need to start engaging the public in an actual interest in what science is doing in and of itself. And he doesn't think that this is a hard task or an impossible task to do, but he's concerned that universities are backing away from it. Okay? Scientists need, he thinks, to be able to seclude themselves from the public, to not worry about immediate practical ends, in order to do the kind of intense, focused, Weber calls it the mania, of pursuing their point and to get appropriate critical feedback that is at a high enough level to stimulate that work. And they can't constantly be worrying about, is this going to immediately generate a practical result? But that's okay, because you can be accountable to the public for what you're actually doing. You can be honest to the public about what you're actually doing, uh, rather than trying to divert everything into a discussion of immediate applicability. Then he begins the turn of the article toward questions about science and economy as possible models for other social institutions. And so he raises the issue that science at its foundation looks particularly hostile to authority. And he asks whether this is still the case today. He refers to a lot of the texts that we have been reading for Kant, Descartes, Bacon, uh, Mill, and says, the problem with saying, based on these texts, that current day science is hostile to authority is that a lot of the authorities that these people are reacting to, these classical authors are reacting to, have actually been defeated historically. They're no longer the authorities we're dealing with. Science is now so widely institutionalized around the globe, its authority is generally accepted. It has high influence and reasonable resourcing. And so it's got to be a little bit careful as an institution if it does not demonstrate that it can effectively police itself. It is going to invite political interference as a response. So he examines the nature of scientific opinion. He says, the functions of scientific authority 
go far beyond a mere confirmation of facts asserted by science. And again, this is contested if you think about the debates over uh, reports of research done about global warming. There is a lot of contestation over where scientific opinion stops, where its validity stops. Does it stop at just the facts and the interpretation belongs somewhere else? Can it do interpretations but not analyze the implications for policy? So he's addressing that kind of problem. He says, for one thing, there are no mere facts in science. A scientific fact is one that has been accepted as such by scientific opinion, both on the grounds of the evidence in favor of it and because it appears sufficiently plausible in view of current scientific conception of the nature of things. Besides, science is not a mere collection of facts, but a system of facts based on their scientific interpretation. It is this system that is endorsed by a scientific authority. Science is what it is in virtue of the way in which the scientific authority constantly eliminates or else recognizes at various levels of merit contributions offered to science. In accepting the authority of science, we accept the totality of all these value judgments. Okay, so this sounds like a very, you know, everything that science says goes kind of position. And then he says a very interesting thing. It's not something that many people will express in thinking about science unless they're trying to use it critically to argue that science is violating its purpose somehow. He says we need to think of scientific authority as a tradition. Okay, and he goes back to this idea that individual scientists are competent only in a very limited specialization with enough expertise to sort of extend into neighboring areas. And he says each such acceptance appears then as a submission to a vast range of value judgments exercised over all the domains of science, which the newly accepted citizen of science henceforth endorses, although he knows hardly anything about their subject matter. And again, if you take a look at the Weber for this week, there's a very similar conception. We've got specializations that limit our ability to know about other things. We have faith in the idea that if we wanted to look closely, at those other areas, we'd be able to find out enough and skill ourselves up enough to replicate the arguments in favor of particular facts and particular interpretations. But we accept the institutional structure on the whole, except in our own specialization where we're part of the process of policing new insights. But he says, the standards of scientific method are seen to be transmitted from generation to generation by the affiliation of individuals at a great variety of widely disparate points in much the same way as artistic, moral, or legal traditions are transmitted. Okay, so when you look at science from the outside and watch how it transmits things, it basically transmits a whole tradition. It transmits a tradition that people are not equipped individually to assess in all of its moments, and so they're accepting it much as they would accept other sorts of traditions that we pass on. We may conclude, therefore, he says, that the appreciation of scientific merit, too, is based on a tradition which succeeding generations accept and develop as their own scientific opinion. This conclusion gains important support from the fact that the methods of scientific inquiry cannot be explicitly formulated and hence can be transmitted only in the same way as an art by the affiliation of apprentices to a master. Okay, he has in mind the way that PhDs are traditionally granted. This is actually something that's fluid at the moment, and there would certainly be people at this precise moment that would question the artisanal vision of how we train academics, how we train scientists. But at the point that he's writing, it is still the only model. And so it, it affects how he's going to conceptualize what science can be. He says the authority of science is essentially traditional. Okay? That's going to be controversial at the time that he's writing, long before the time that he's writing, and now, but this is his position. But it's a weird tradition. So it's traditional, but it's a tradition that, as he said previously in this piece, cultivates originality. It encourages dissent. It doesn't encourage dissent from the whole enterprise. It is highly hostile to people who say the whole thing is bunk, the whole thing is nonsense, I don't accept any of the basic premises. It's pretty hostile to people who want to reject very large, important, well-established components of scientific consensus. But it's unusually open to contributions to new criticisms 
uh, of specialist points. So he says scientific tradition enforces its teachings in general for the very purpose of cultivating their subversion in particular. And he compares this to Burke, whom we saw when we took a look at classical liberalism and its critics, where Burke is horrified at the French Revolution for trying to wipe everything away all at once. And he says, you know, surely it would be more sensible to innovate around your tradition. Okay, you've got a tradition, it suggests a trajectory, surely you can use that. And Polanyi is saying that particular kind of conservatism actually can be seen at work in practice with science. Okay? And he argues that, interestingly, most people don't say that's what they're doing, but in practice it's dominant. So again, referring to some of the people that we've taken a look at in previous weeks, Polanyi says, modern man claims that he will believe nothing unless it is unassailable by doubt. Descartes, Kant, John Stuart Mill, and Bertrand Russell have unanimously taught him this. They leave us no grounds for accepting any tradition. Again, the idea with these classical authors, Russell's more recent, we may take a look at him in later weeks, but with these classical authors, the idea is that tradition falls on the artifice side of things. It is artificial, it is a contingent human product, and therefore it's not reliable enough to found your knowledge. So you can't found knowledge on tradition, but Polanyi is saying, look, we may say this in terms of our theory, but in practice it's what we do. So we now see that science itself can be pursued and transmitted to succeeding generations only within an elaborate system of traditional beliefs and values, just as traditional beliefs have provided, proved indispensable throughout the life of society. What can one do then? What does this mean for us that we have this theoretical basis of sort of radical doubt and the need for absolute certainty, whereas in practice we've got these much messier traditional values that we're passing on, but they're traditional values that allow a revisionism and critique. And he says we have to understand that institutions like science and like the capitalist market should be seen as special cases of a higher principle, and we need to articulate that principle because it will make it easier for our theoretical understanding of what we're doing to correspond to what we actually do. He says the Republic of Science shows us an association of independent initiatives combined toward an indeterminate achievement. It is disciplined and motivated by serving a traditional authority. But this authority is dynamic. Its continued existence depends on its constant self-renewal through the originality of its followers. Okay, so it is a tradition, but part of that tradition is the constant revision of the tradition itself. And that is what is and should be transmitted. The Republic of Science, he says, is a society of explorers. Such a society strives toward an unknown future, which it believes to be accessible and worth achieving. In the case of scientists, the explorers strive toward a hidden reality for the sake of intellectual satisfaction. So it's a personal goal that motivates the scientists. And as they satisfy themselves, they enlighten all men and are thus helping society fulfill its obligation toward intellectual self-improvement. Okay, so you don't have to be motivated in Polanyi's framework by the desire to do great public good. You can be motivated by your own intellectual self-satisfaction. It doesn't matter. The institutional structure is set up the right way that you can have that selfish motivation and yet you can still make a contribution to the betterment of society as a whole. And then he concludes with re reflections on what this might mean, what the model of the Republic of Science might mean for thinking about a free society. And again, when you're writing through much of the 20th century about the free society, it's the Soviet Union you've got in the back of your mind as the sort of other of that society he views the possibility for a free society that is a generalization of this scientific principle, looking at all forms of self-improvement. Okay, so the market is the direction of this principle toward the improvement of material reproduction. Science is the direction of this principle toward the sort of intellectual achievements of society. And he thinks you can do this toward all other ways in which society could be improved. So a society bent on discovery must advance by supporting independent initiatives, coordinating themselves mutually to each other. 
Such adjustments may include rivalries and opposing responses, which in society as a whole will be far more frequent than they are within science. Even so, all these independent initiatives must accept for their guidance a traditional authority, enforcing its own self-renewal by cultivating originality among its followers. Okay, so he wants different specialized sectors of society, all with their own progressive character, all that have a, a line of tradition that they are transmitting where the tradition itself has an open-ended quality, where the tradition itself is encouraging development, dissent, and innovation. It's not leagues away from the sort of thing that Habermas was discussing in week two. He calls it a dynamic orthodoxy. It implicitly grants the right to opposition in the name of truth, where truth here is a sort of a catch-all category that refers to all manner of excellence that we recognize as the ideal of self-improvement. And then he does a sort of a Kantian move here, and not in a good sense. The freedom of the individual safeguarded by such a society has no bearing on the right of men to do as they please but assures them the right to speak the truth as they know it. Okay? Obey, but think freely. Such a society does not offer particularly wide private freedoms. It is the cultivation of public liberties that distinguishes a free society as defined here. Okay? And this should look very, very familiar from the Kant that we looked at in week two. So he adopts Burke's commitment to tradition but he wants to weld it onto a system that is desiring to cultivate radical progress. And what he's after is a system that is progressive, that has emotion, that is moving toward a future in a decentralized way, but he wants to have institutions that nevertheless impede any deliberate total renewal of society. And again, what he has in mind are the various political movements that have tried to impose, in a very absolute sense, their own will on history. He's thinking about fascism. He's thinking about Stalinism. He's thinking of various forms of quite radical social change. And he thinks that some of the conservative elements between, within institutions like science can actually usefully impede that sort of situation.